This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is LG's fabulous phablet for late 2015. This is the LG V10. No more G's in the name. Imagine if it was the LG G V10. That would be really hard, right? Anyway, 5.7 inch main display, a secondary display up top. We'll talk about that. Ah, these gimmicks, right? Two front facing cameras, not just one, and they work independently. It's not like some depth sensing technology or something for background blur effects. And a new sort of new look on the back here. We have have this durable, rubbery kind of texture, still removable, still can replace the battery easily. You can put in a micro SD card, fast Snapdragon 808 inside, and a even further improved camera from the LG G4, which was one of the best cameras of the year among smartphones. And the price tag is not cheap. It's $700 full retail. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, the LG V10. It is indeed a big handful of a phone, the same size as the iPhone 6S Plus. And well, pretty right up there with the, the Nexus 6, which was one heck of a big phone. For that, you do get a 5.7 inch display. And here it is next to the iPhone. So you can see, which has a little shiny clear case on it, but you get the idea about the size. They're both pretty huge phones. And here's the LG G4, a lovely phone. And, and Compact given the 5.5 inch screen size that it has there, but you get the idea. This is a little bit taller. Anyway, big phablet of a phone, QHD Quantum IPS Plus display. That's LG marketing term for the nice IPS displays they use in the phone. And this other, see that? I'm moving it independently. We is a secondary display up top. Now we've seen manufacturers play with that idea before. Samsung has been doing it quite a bit, obviously, back with the Note Edge, which had a edge screen on one side only. Then we had the Galaxy S6 Edge and Edge Plus, for example. So I, I still feel like manufacturers are just throwing things out there and see if anything sticks, if anything really catches on. And secondary displays are something they just don't want to give up on just yet, trying. We'll talk about it a little bit more and how useful it is in a bit, but let's run down the rest of the specs here. This is a 6.77 ounce phone. It's a heavy phone. It's the same weight as the BlackBerry Priv we just reviewed, although that's a smaller phone. Interestingly, that was a weighty phone too, so you'll feel the weight of this in your pocket. Obviously, it's a big phone. It has the distinctive LG kind of curve shape here, but not quite as much compared to, say, here's the the G4, which gets even more tapered on the edges there. And we've got metal on the sides here. LG's trying to make it a little bit more classy. And instead of the interesting backs we saw with the G4, the leather option, the fake metal option, the, the for sure, no kidding, I'm plastic back, we have this durable, dura something they call it. It's kind of a ruggedized material. It has texture. It is grippy. Is it attractive? Well, if you like the look of OtterBox cases and other rugged things, you'll probably say sure it is. Otherwise, meh. And it's available in a couple of different colors. This will vary depending on country and carrier, but white, obviously the black we have here, and something called opal, which is pretty much the color of this car on the screen, as a matter of fact. And <laughs> well, it's an interesting statement together with the texture on the back. It, it is a sturdy feeling phone. Again, you got the metal on the sides. You have this impact absorbing kind of rubbery stuff here. You know, uh, it's not it's not something that you're supposed to throw around. They're not saying that this can take a heck of a lot of abuse, but it should help a little bit for those who are uh, slippery handed with their phones. And for one last size comparison, this is the Galaxy Note 5, which is actually a little bit smaller. Of course, this guy is glass and metal construction versus LG's rugged rubbery material and metal. Inside the phone is running on the 1.8 gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon 808 CPU with four gigs of RAM, and that's as most you're gonna find in a smartphone right now, and 64 gigs of storage, which is nice for your, your standard offering here. You don't have to pay extra for that. That's the standard configuration. Snapdragon 808 is among the higher end CPUs. The A10 is the only one that's higher. The A10 is kind of infamous for being a little bit toasty, you know, not having as good battery life, so we don't mind the 808. The 808 is also used in the LG 
G4 and in the Moto X Pure Edition, the, the BlackBerry Priv. A lot of phones. It's perfectly fine CPU and it's responsive and it's fast. In fact, it feels a little bit perkier than even the LG G4. Could be a little bit extra RAM or more performance tuning they have had time to do with this. It is running Android 5.1.1 Lollipop. Sorry, I know Marshmallow has been shipping on a few phones like well, obviously the Nexus phones and the HTC One A9. This is still Lollipop with LG's usual heavy-handed UI. If you're an LG person or even a Samsung person with TouchWiz, they, they have a lot in common here. It's, it's not to my taste, even though I love my LG G4 and it doesn't stop me from owning one. I, yeah, I tend to put a custom launcher on to get rid of these kind of, I don't know, I don't like the way the icons look, and to simplify the UI and the way they do settings, where the settings have settings. And there's so many things you can customize, which can be quite nice, but it can also be a little bit overwhelming and confusing here. And by default, you can see we have the tabbed layout for the settings right there. You can even rearrange your home touch buttons. Nothing new for LG there. We have their usual multi-window multitasking. And there are settings for the new top display right up there. That top display is 1040 by 160 pixels tall. It is a separate little physical display up top there next to the dual front-facing cameras. And um, it's there as a little application launcher, which could be handy. One of the things I liked about the Note Edge is that you could pick what applications you wanted to have there and quick launch so you didn't have to clutter up your home screen so much. It will tell you basic status. You can have it have a message of your choice in that real tacky font right there. And it can have context-sensitive controls as well. So if you're in the camera, for example, the controls can be there on the side, which that is kind of neat. So. You can have your, your favorite contacts up there. I leave it up to you as to whether you feel like that's going to be useful to you. If you don't actually like it, you can disable it. By default, it's always on. So let's turn off the phone right now. And this is an LG. So that means that the volume up and down and the power button are on the back. And when it's turned off, it's very faint. And as you can see here, now that we've turned our main display off, it's always up there giving you status, you know. It, Again, that's kind of nice. It doesn't seem to use a whole lot of power, but you can actually disable that too. And it does have, it uses the, the, the front sensor on there to know if it's in a pocket, it actually will shut itself off completely. The phone has LG's knock-on feature, which is you t tap it to turn on the phone. Now we have the fingerprint sensor enabled for this, and that is on the back. And I'm going to talk about exactly what a problem that is right now. See, I'm, I'm just there we go. Finally, I got it. Uh, the fingerprint scanner itself isn't bad. In fact, it's the same one you used on one of the recent Nexus phones right there. First off, you actually have to press it in, click it as if you were turning the phone on and not just rest your finger on top of it to wake the phone up. The second is I have no problem with LG putting their controls on the back of the phone, but when you're holding it like that and you can't see where your finger is, and this is not very tactile, the difference here isn't really great, and you have to be pretty centered on this. It's really actually hard to to get the sweet spot to get the fingerprint scanner to work consistently, I find so. Not too, too thrilled about that. I mean, and I love fingerprint scanners too. I would like to see that work better, but it, it's, yeah, it's hard. While we're looking at the back here, you can see we have our two-tone LED flash. This has the usual laser focus for the camera. And this is a 16 megapixel camera, which is the same as the LG G4, but it's got more tweaks going on. It's an f1.8 lens. It's pretty darn fast. And on the front, those two cameras, why do they exist? You have two right there. They don't work in conjunction with each other to do anything special. You can choose which one you want. They're both 5 megapixel. One is kind of your standard view front camera, which is, you know, a bit on the wide side. And the other one's an ultra wide camera. The idea being, and I actually kind of appreciate this, the regular selfie one is good for video chat. It's good for your taking pictures of just yourself, and it won't distort your features too much. Wide angle lenses really can distort your features, make your nose look even bigger than it is. If you're me, well, you don't need your nose to be any bigger. General distortion happens. So instead of just equipping this with an ultra wide angle lens, which some manufacturers have done, you have your choice. You can use the ultra wide if you want to catch context. What's, what's in the background behind you? You're in the Bahamas, awesome palm trees, the beach, hey, whatever it is, a rock concert or something like that. Or if you want to do a group selfie. So that's why you have the choice. Is that a killer feature for this phone? No, probably not. But it's there. This is a phone that has a lot of bells and whistles and gimmicks. One thing we know and love about LG phones is they usually have removable batteries and micro SD card slots. That's how they, they manage to keep the, the fight against Samsung, who is banishing such things. 
and it fits on pretty tight. This is not a waterproof back or anything like that, but you peel it off and there it is. And we have our 3000 milliamp removable battery, so you can swap in a spare if you want. In fact, for the month of December, LG is running a promotion in the United States where if you buy the phone, you get a free second battery, a charger for the battery, and a 64 gig micro SD card, because yes, it has a micro SD card slot right there, right on top of the nano SIM card slot. So let's talk about audio a little bit. We're going to play one of our YouTube videos of the HTC One A9 so you can hear the built-in speaker that fires from the bottom. It's nothing special, just to give you a hint. Headphone jack, however, you're going to get better audio. This has a 32-bit Sabre audio DAC and headphone amp, which is pretty impressive stuff. It, it has nice specs. Now, the thing is, 32-bit music is pretty hard to find, but even without that, it, it does have very nice sound through the headphone jack. And for those of you who are music fans, that's important. So let's hear it sounds through the speaker. And we're about two-thirds of volume from Mac, Max right now. This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the HTC One A. Not to be confused with the M9, the M8. Yeah, you're going to want to use headphones. It's kind of buzzy. Meh. You get the idea. So how about the camera? Here it is. Now, LG did a great job with the camera. It's pretty quick and pretty responsive. The only issue I've had with the camera is sometimes it misses focus. Usually it's pretty obvious. You can see it on screen. Once or twice it's been close enough to being in focus that I didn't realize it until I offload the pictures to my computer and said, oh, bummer. Anyway, that's a little bit odd. That is something clearly that they could fix. In general, the focus is pretty good. But this is a fast, responsive, you can tap to focus there, UI. And it's pretty intuitive too, especially considering the fact you have a whole lot of manual controls here. You can see we have auto, we have manual, we have simple, if you don't even want to see this much stuff on here. And let's go to manual for a minute, just so you can see. So here we got white balance, manual focus if you want, your ISO, your shutter speed, EVs, AE lock. Now you can't control the f-stop on this. That's the only thing that you can't do. If you go back to auto, you still have a reasonable amount of control. Switching between the front and back cameras and then switching between which of those cameras that you want. Controlling your flash. All sorts of stuff. 4K video recording is here. And for more settings here, you've got multi-view. So you can do a combo of front and rear cameras if you want. Slow motion, time-lapse photography. There's a lot of stuff to play with here, and it's not just a bunch of useless features. It actually takes nice photo and video. So, show you a few samples now. Low light shots. By the way, the screen on this is pretty nice. It's typical of LG's IPS displays. It's on the cool side, but it's not lifeless and dead by any means. You can see the warmth here in the white wine bottles. Viewing angles on this QHD display, 515 PPI pixel density, that's good. It's QHD 2560 by 1440 resolution. Viewing angles, not so great. Overall brightness, okay, not super impressive, but anyway, a little digression into screen quality, quite nice. You can see the amount of detail that it captured here. Very readable, very sharp, even as you zoom in. This camera is very impressive. The first pictures that I shot with this, I was really impressed. It's as good as a good quality point and shoot a lot of the time, and that says a lot. Now, none of these camera phones can approach a digital SLR with a good lens on it. I mean, you're talking about a teeny little lens on the back there. It's only so much you can do, but it is better than the LG G4 even. More natural, a dimensional. There's an doesn't have that flat look that a lot of camera phone pictures have. That's looking very nice. Now here's one where you can see the colors on the screen are actually quite nice. That's beautiful, but it's slightly missed focus. And you won't notice that until you look at it, really zoom in or you look at it on your computer screen. Again, it doesn't happen often. It's usually pretty noticeable. 4K video right here. This has OIS, optical image stabilization, along with software stabilization, by the way. Also very good quality. We'll play there. 4K video taken with the LG Three very effective Nintendo. mics, too. Let's move quickly to see Jello. Now, speak. Sample 4K video. Speaking of the jello effect thing, it, it's pronounced, and that means when if you're moving the camera pretty quickly, buildings seem to go woo, like they're doing the wave to follow the direction of motion. It's noticeable at 1080p and much less so at 4K. Colors captured are very good. Now, this is what I'm actually using for the home screen right here. This is a beautiful old restored Chevy wagon. Nice colors, nice sharpness, the, the detail on the chrome without whiting out on that mirror. It's, it's good. It's really very good. 
And here's a long shot of the beautiful car. Again, it's very natural, very dimensional. The highlights are not distorting it anyway. The colors are nice and rich and fairly natural, not overblown. The, the colors are a little cooler and a little more subdued than, say, the Samsung Galaxy S6 or Note 5. It's really a matter of personal preference as to how that rolls, which you would like better. Of course, they can all be enhanced afterwards with Photoshop or whatever you like. Now, it is a very wide angle lens. If you want to do pretty things like flower shots up close, you can get quite close here, but no matter, no matter what I did, that was the closest I could get, and it still pulled in more of the background than I would have liked. There's still a place in your life for the digital SLR, in other words. Now, here's a funny picture. You might think, what the heck was I doing here? The idea is this is a very dark room. This is my study. It's like a cave, and doing something like taking a picture of a white sneaker in a dark room should introduce all sorts of problems. It did not overexpose the sneaker. There's actually quite a lot of detail here. It handled it very well. At low light, it works pretty well. I find sometimes tweaking with manual settings work. Likewise, here's the cat in the dark room, and it captured the warm tones in his fur really very nicely. Now, the two-tone flash actually led to a little, instead of white out, you see that little corner right there? It did a little yellow out. Isn't that different and interesting? But overall, really fine camera, and it is one of the selling points of the phone. LG has been making a big deal about the imagery in their flagship phones. It's a nice camera. Other features include the usual dual-band Wi-Fi, 802.11ac. Of course, it has 4G LTE, Bluetooth 4.1, NFC, and a GPS with GLONASS. So for benchmarks with the Snapdragon 808, Quadrant 26,700, Antutu 45,758, Geekbench 3, 1183 single core, 3580, 3580 for the multi-core test, and for 3D, 3D Mark Ice Storm Unlimited, 18,171. About where we would expect the Snapdragon 808 to score, and a little bit above, like I said, the LG G4, and we'll throw up a comparison graph so you can see how it does against some other phones. So in terms of performance, it's fine. I don't feel like I need the Snapdragon 810 in here. All the programs are responsive. Gaming is fine on this. The battery, mm, 3000 milliamps is a pretty good battery for a phablet. And we've seen some that are a little bit larger, but that it hasn't translated into stunning battery life. It lasts, with light to moderate use, a full day on a charge. That means till I get up until, say, 10 p.m. at night. With light to moderate use, if you use it more heavily, it needs some charging during the day or swapping in a spare battery if you happen to get one. Yeah, it's, it's okay, you know, we're talking four and a half hours of screen on time or so. It's not bad, but it's not fantastic either. And for those of you who say it ain't so unless you've seen it for yourself, here's Asphalt 8 playing and running very, very nicely on the phone. So, whoo, crash. How about call quality on this? We tested both the AT&T and the T-Mobile versions, and call quality on both was very good. Data speeds are pretty much standard among all carrier phones these days. Uh, likewise, call volume is pretty well standardized, actually, by the government. There are requirements for that, too. Uh, but very nice, clear full call audio. So as a voice phone, very good job with that. As a gaming phone, if you're actually paying attention while you're driving, which I'm not right now, there we go, that's getting better. It's great. Plenty enough horsepower to handle gaming and a pretty enough display and a high resolution display. It's a real pleasure to use. By the way, for those of you who are into our giveaways, we will be giving away an LG V10 courtesy of LG. Thanks a lot for making that possible, LG. So look for that video separately. We'll be doing that. In sum, if you already have an LG G4, I don't know if it's worth the expense of upgrading to this, honestly. If you're coming from some other phone, you haven't bought a new phone in a couple of years, and you're considering the V10 over the LG G4, and you got the money to spend on it, uh, the camera is a bit better. I mean, you're not going to lose much with the LG G4 there. And <laughs> this one is a big handful. That's the thing. It's a real nice phone. It's got plenty of flagshipy things. It's got plenty of gimmicks too, like those two front facing cameras. You might appreciate, you might think, nah, the, the top scrolly screen, that's something new that it adds. You might say, well, that's really cool or I don't need it. At this price, of course, it's competing with things like the Samsung Galaxy Note 5, the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus for big screen phones, the iPhone 6S Plus is still going to be a bit more than this, at least $50 more. So there's a lot of competition out there. Pretty much, I would say, photography is your thing. The removable battery and the SD card slot float your boat. Those are the strong selling points for the V10. So that's the LG 
V10. It's available now again in the United States. It's on AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon. Also, the price differences will be a little bit different between those carriers. And, you know, they have monthly payment plans. They have two-year contracts. They have full retail. You get the idea there. Is it worth the money above the regular LG G4, which is a really fine phone and still one of the best camera phones on the market and now pretty affordable because it's been out for several months? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's hard. You get a little bit bigger screen here, but it's not a lot bigger. You do get that second screen if that floats your boat well, that's for you. The camera on the back is even further improved. It's kind of uncanny how good the pictures can be with this. Now, the LG G4 is no slouch either, but still, it is certainly a step up, even from the excellent LG G4. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel.